Rachel Greathouse, and um, I work for St. Louis Composting and Total Organics uh, Recycling. We're a sister company, um, so we're going to kind of get into uh, what St. Louis Composting is and, uh, and Total Organics, but I'm the Sustainability Coordinator, and I've been here for about six months. So and I've, Roy. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so I'm Roy Gross. I've been with the company for about 12 years now. And I, I wear a lot of different hats. Um, I guess my main role is the sales uh, of the finished materials, whether that be soil, compost, or mulch. Uh, typically, a lot of my clients are the uh, lawn care operators, uh, retail garden centers, or large commercial sites that we supply directly with those various products. So um, been with the company, like I said, for about 12 years. So. Kind of, kind of been with them through a, a giant growth spurt, if you will. So, uh, but that's kind of where my background lies. Great. So, um, feel free to message us as we go along. Um, I'm going to show a PowerPoint presentation, and Roy and I will just be going back and forth. Um, feel free to interject with any questions that you may have, and get to our share screen. Alrighty, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. Roy, please give me a nod if you can. Yeah, you're good. Okay, great. Um, so we're gonna be talking about commercial food uh, scrap composting with uh, St. Louis Composting. They are the ones that manage the, um, the, the material. Um, monkey and see, we, monkey do. Go dry yourself off. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, it, they're the ones that manage the material and we are the ones, uh, Total Organics Recycling are the ones that um, collect the material and pick it up for um, businesses such as Schnucks and St. Louis Cardinals um, and uh, Parkway and Pattonville School Districts. So we're going to get into that in a little bit. So I'd like to start with this um, fact. So the U.S. only has about 6% of the world's population, but we produce over 50% of the world's trash. Um, so this seems like a big um, difference in equation, right? So we're only a small portion of, of the entire world's population, but um, we carry a majority um, of producing the, the waste that's in our world. Um, so that goes for recycling, that also goes for composting and just landfill in general. Um, I know St. Louis uh, City Recycles uh, presented earlier today about recycling. Um, so this is the other half of the equation. Composting is a big player um, when we're talking about our waste. And um, a lot of people get introduced um, to composting because they start to recycle and they say, how can I reduce my waste further? So we hope that you take this dive with us and that you get interested in composting. So a little bit about our companies. Um, Roy can speak a little bit more to this, but St. Louis Composting was founded in 1992. Um, and Roy, can you tell a little bit about how Patrick got started with the bill and everything? Yeah, so originally back in 1992, uh, legislation was passed that yard waste can no longer be uh, put into a landfill. And that's really what started the commercial composting boom, I guess, in the, uh, at least in the Missouri, uh, state of Missouri. Uh, other states have enacted similar legislations, uh, typically much later than 1992. So Missouri was sort of one of the uh, first states to get into that. And what that meant was that your leaves, your grass clippings, uh, tree trimmings, any logs that were produced from uh, tree removal, things like that, um, had to have al an alternative home. And that's when Patrick, um, the co-founder of the uh, Total or, or St. Louis Composting, uh, started the compost yards and uh, things have just kind of, kind of grown from there. It, it was slow in the beginning and it certainly uh, ramped up more recently in the, in the latter years. And we only see a potential for bigger growth as we go forward. Yeah, and so part of that um, growth was in 2014, Total Organics Recycling, the company I work for, um, was acquired and um, it was formerly Blue Skies Recycling. Um, and we are the, the hauler that picks up um, the commercial food scraps from restaurants and businesses around the St. Louis and Illinois region. 
Um, so St. Louis Composting has seven different locations, which is incredible. Um, and two of those sites are um, commercial compost sites where we actually compost our, the food scraps. Um, a little bit more about Total Organic. So, um, you know, we've been around since 2014, but we service over 450 partners and about 600 tons that we pick up every week. Um, which is over a million pounds um, that we collect every week of food scraps. Now that doesn't turn into a million pounds of compost as Roy will tell you a little bit later on, um, but still an incredible amount of food waste um, that is being collected from grocery stores and restaurants um, and schools. So what is organics recycling? So first off, um, it is its own waste stream. So when you're talking about organics, it does need to be separated, much like recycling. You can't just throw it all into one bin with your trash and your food waste um, and hope that it gets separated, right? And in order for it to be um, manufactured and harvested, we have to separate it. Um, so it's just simply uh, for total organics, we've got these yellow totes that we provide um, where restaurants and businesses can keep their food waste separate um, from their recycling and from their trash um, to maximize um, the amount of, uh, of clean material, clean meaning the food waste. Um, second is we take it to a compost facility, which Roy will be diving into a lot um, more later. And um, after it's finished, um, you can use it to improve your soils and we're gonna get into all the benefits. But this is just a high level view of where we're going. So what is organics recycling? So like I said, it's uh, separating out um, uh, food waste from the rest of your materials. Um, contamination, we're gonna dive into that a little bit and what um, the serious factors of contamination are. Um, but with composting, it has to be a lot less um, than your recycling rate. Like we don't want, I came from the world of recycling, so you can get away with a little bit of contamination when you're talking about recycling. But when you're talking about composting, it's 0% that you can get away with um, with uh, contamination because you're going to find it six months later when you're digging through and sifting through that can break down machines and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so it's a separated source separated uh, material. Um, this allows things to go full circle, right? It was food and now it's becoming compost, which grows new food. Um, so it's a really neat full circle process um, when you're thinking about it. And then um, incorporating that compost back into the environment is um, incredibly important and we're going to look at the benefits of that as well. Um, so why separate them? So it is a valuable resource. When compost is sent to the landfill, it is one of the biggest emitters of methane gas and methane gas is one of the, is the number one contributor to climate change. Um, so people have the misconception that food waste, oh, if it goes to a landfill, it's going to break down. Um, that might be true if it's on the top layer, but when you're talking about a landfill, usually they're several hundred feet down. Um, and for something to break down in a landfill, you need sunlight and oxygen. And two things that we don't have in the landfill are sunlight and oxygen. So what it does is um, it creates the methane gas as it's heating up and trying to break down. Um, and that methane gas leads to um, eroding of the ozone layer and creating um, climate change. So when we recover um, the organics as a valuable or separate it, it becomes a valuable resource. Um, and we're also saving space in a landfill. Um, Roy can get to enhancing the soil structure um, and adding nutrients, but Roy, I'll let you speak. Yeah, so compost is simply um, what mother nature has intended to, to do in a forest. So we, we've all probably walked through a forest at one point in our uh, lifetime and you see the leaves that fall, you see the uh, branches that fall and uh, mother nature has this incredible plan for those things that where they break down and they actually uh, feed the soil. It, it, it improves the soil health and therefore allows the ability for new seedlings to grow and, and uh, become uh, big plants or trees or depending on whatever they may be. Um, it also provides a lot of uh, bacteria, fungi, uh, mycorrhizal activity in the soil itself. So you have a very uh, ha happy, healthy 
uh, soil that's a living entity that uh, requires this in, influx of compost to perform the jobs that it was needed to do. And, and we've all seen that um, soils that have a lot more organic matter, they're less erodible, they're uh, much more uh, productive soils, if you will, whether that be through agriculture or forestry or uh, whatever where you're expecting that soil to provide. So um, there's, a, there's a, just an ever increasing amount of benefits that you can uh, that you can receive from your soil through the uh, introduction of compost, whether that be through mother nature and, and the way she does it, which is kind of a slow process or what we do here at St. Louis composting is we, we basically take that exact same process, but we manage it and we uh, increase the, uh, well, we increase the uh, amount of compost that we produce in, in a relatively short time. So we're just kind of speeding up mother nature's process and helping her out a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a great way to describe it. It's exactly what Mother Nature does, but for a long period of time. And um, we're just taking that, that same method and, um, you know, speeding up the process, you know, so it's finished in four to six months and stuff, years and years and years. Um, but the, one of my favorite things about compost, and I noticed it on um, our slide, was the increased water retention ability. Um, so, so compost, when it's laid down, you know, on your vegetable beds or your garden bed, um, it's, it allows to soak up, is it six more times, Roy? Yes, six more so it's, compost will actually uh, retain six times its weight in water. So what'll happen is, and I've seen this on my lawn where I've, got compost over the years, um, you, you basically build up this reservoir of water so that when we do get into the hot dry months, um, you'll notice anything that has compost um, will stay green and will have that, uh, you know, that lush kind of look for a much longer time than soils that have a very low organic matter. And typically in the St. Louis area, I can only speak for that because we do quite a bit of soil testing in this area. Most soils, unless they've had a uh, influx of compost added to them, only have about 1% uh, organic matter in the native soils. And we like to see soils in that 5 to 10% range. Obviously, mm -hmm. it would be the minimum 10%, about the maximum. There's really not much return on your investment after you go over 10%. But soils within that range tend to be the most productive and the uh, you know, most benefit for the plant plant material that's growing on those soils. Yeah. In fact, um, one last fact before I move forward, um, it just dawned on me last summer in my six raised vegetable beds, I didn't have to water at all um, the entire summer. Um, once I got the plants established um, by like May through August, just the natural rainfall that was happening and then my raised bed mix that I had, um, that compost added to it didn't have to water all, all summer. It was, it maintained its, its vigor. So it's pretty cool what compost can do. Um, so uh, simply put, what is compost? It's just the decomposition of organic matter um, through the, the use of heat, um, water, aeration, um, and microbes. Um, and so yeah, this is just the breakdown. Um, we're gonna get into how to make compost too. And Roy is going to take it over from here, kind of a little bit behind the scenes since you can't see our facility. Right. So most of the time, what takes place, um, and you can see from this uh, set of pictures in this slide, the uh, organics go into one of the bins, which Total Organics uh, picks up. Um, they basically go into these specialized trucks, which we call rendering trucks. Um, that's the second photo there where you can see the produce being uh, dumped and it, it looks as if it's being dumped on the ground, but there's actually what we call a bed of wood fiber. So it's uh, any liquids are actually being absorbed so that we're not lost um, in the compost process because of the heat. Um, moisture is actually evaporated out of those piles when you get up into the 140 to 160 degree range, which is required for proper uh, decomposition. There's a lot of moisture that's lost. Uh, just evaporated into the atmosphere. So we like to keep that. Um, if you move on to that third picture, you can see the front end loader um, dropping the produce into a uh, partially composted row of orga uh, 
organic material. Typically those rows start off as just yard waste and uh, a little bit of uh, uh, green, green waste material, grass clippings or something like that. And uh, now they're introducing the, uh, the food waste. And I thought it was kind of a unique term. I didn't realize that our, that our operational folks that, who run the loaders and things, but they call it making a, making a taco because they split open the top of that row very much like a taco shell and then insert the food waste into the middle and then immediately cover that up. Um, covering it up prevents a lot of vectors and things from getting into that. If you've ever been around a landfill, uh, there's quite a bird population in, in those areas. And due to our timeliness of covering those food scraps, um, we'd have very little uh, vector interference with our compost. And uh, from that slide, if you go on to the, to the next one, there's a uh, just rows of, of compost that are sitting and uh, breaking down. It, it looks like the compost isn't doing anything, but you'd be surprised the, uh, the amount of microbial activities in those rows are just phenomenal. And, and the microbes are really, those are our employees. Those are the guys who are actually doing the hard work of transferring food waste and, and the green waste into a usable compost. And then in the last picture, um, this is uh, one of our compost rows being turned. And the one thing that microbes really like, they like to have plenty of oxygen to do their work. They're, they're similar to us. Um, you know, if we have plenty of uh, food, water, oxygen, things like that, we, we can be very productive. Uh, if you take away the oxygen, yeah, we're not so productive. And the microbes are kind of the same way. So through the use of the uh, row turner, which is that large piece of equipment, uh, we can reintroduce oxygen into those piles. And by doing that, we also create uh, more heat in the pile. And obviously the outside edges need to be brought to the interior of the pile so that the pile is uniformly composted throughout the entire, uh, the entire volume of that. So uh, that's kind of the real basic way of how you make compost. And then I believe this is our depackager. So what you're gonna see here is a short little video of how um, and I believe those are cans of tomatoes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm, and green beans. Those, yeah, how those get, uh, make their way into the, uh, to the compost rows. So I guess, Rachel, if you want to click on that. Yeah, it's, uh, well, we tested it out earlier and it worked, but now it's uh, not wanting to do that. Okay, well. Hmm. Sorry, well, that's not working. We'll just move on to the next slide. I do apologize. Oh, can I move? There we go. Okay. So basically what we were trying to show you in that previous picture, there's actually a piece of equipment called the depackager that will separate out packaging from food waste. Um, essentially that goes into a bit of a slurry and then that slurry can be applied to the windrows. Um, typically that's hauled in tanker trucks and it shows up at the sites and very much like the uh, taco that we talked about before with the food scraps going in there, the, uh, this, this semi kind of a solid, semi-solid liquid goes into these composting rows. So what you're viewing here is a picture of our Belleville location. Um, it used to be a coal mine years ago then it was filled with um, trash that has been sitting there for quite some time. I don't know the exact length. And now we operate our compost facility on top of that. So what you're seeing are to the right, upper right part of the uh, picture are just rows and rows of compost. Uh, these rows are approximately eight foot high and about 15 foot wide and hundreds of feet long. And every day we basically create new rows of compost and we harvest the finished rows of compost. So what you're looking at there is about 55 to 60 acres of compost that are taking place. Of course, there's some um, ancillary buildings in the lower left-hand part of the screen. Um, those are for equipment, offices, things like that, some repair uh, shops and so forth. So. Um, again, this is just kind of showing you the process of the organic materials. Um, you can see there in the upper uh, left-hand picture, 
there's uh, some green waste. There's some grass clippings and some brush that's brought in probably by a landscaper or uh, uh, possibly an arborist type company, tree company that's uh, taking down some of that material. Um, again, you can kind of see the taco that we talked about earlier with the food waste going in. Looks like there's a fair amount of uh, tomatoes, oranges, and maybe some green lettuce or something. A little hard to tell. And then the last picture is um, the yard waste bags. A lot of the uh, curbside uh, organic pickup with yard waste um, in the craft paper bags comes to our facility. And right there, that loader is just creating a pile. They're kind of what we call pushing up the piles when the uh, yard waste trucks bring that into our facilities to uh, start the uh, composting process. So if you want to click the next slide. So here, what we're actually doing, um, we have a system. Um, it, it looks kind of rudimentary. There's some, uh, they look like paint stirring sticks stuck in the uh, end of the compost row, but there's information written on those, obviously not, you can't see that in this uh, presentation, but that tells our compost operators when it was tested, the temperature, the moisture, and uh, just it's a kind of a recorded history of that row if you will uh, this is also kept on uh, electronically also but this is just for a visual reference if you're out there and you're driving by with a loader or something you can you can actually see what's taking place and uh, one of our employees there to the right hand side is actually measuring the temperature of that compost row so what that is it's a uh, just a large scale thermometer if you will it has about a six foot, six and a half foot probe that's uh, placed into the interior of the pile so that we can get a reading and uh, a little bit hard to see, but the uh, lower center part, um, if you can look at that real close, it shows that it's right around 140 degrees, which uh, it means that the, uh, the compost is cooking nicely and uh, everything's running as it should. Mm -hmm. so. And uh, this, this picture just shows us turning the wind rows a little closer. Um, this is actually our old compost turner. We actually uh, used that one for quite a number of years. And recently, I think within the last two years, I purchased a, a new one. Um, these are pretty highly specialized pieces of equipment. Uh, I think the, the latest one we bought was uh, about three quarters of a million dollars, give or take a little bit. So uh, they're more or less specialized just for the compost and organics uh, industry. So they're not something you can just go down to your local uh, farm implement store and purchase. But uh, again, this is showing that turner running over the row. Um, you can kind of see some of the uh, evaporation of the water vapor there in the back. You can see like looks like a little steam or a little cloud beginning to form. And that's just that hot compost uh, giving up that moisture to the, uh, to the cooler air. Mm -hmm. uh, these rows basically get turned about every, oh, probably about every, every, maybe 20 to 30 days given uh, the temperature and moisture that's going on. So the final step in the compost is that we, uh, we run it through a screening machine, uh, which is what you're viewing here in the pictures. And what that does is it takes any of the oversized material out of the compost. We like to produce a, what we call a half inch compost, which is our black gold product. And then we also produce a smaller size, a quarter inch uh, material, which is the field and turf enhancer. Uh, they're both exactly the same product. It's simply the size uh, of the finished product. Uh, some go better into grow mixes and athletic fields, and some are better for gardens and uh, turf areas, things like that in your lawn. So this just uh, pulls out any of the uh, debris, which we'd like to say that there's, uh, that there's none in our compost, but um, we'd be, uh, we'd be kind of pulling the wool over your eyes a little bit. Unfortunately, as Rachel I think alluded to earlier, uh, keeping the, uh, the non-compostables out of the uh, waste stream is, is highly important to have a high quality finished material. And through the process of screening, not only does it size that, but it also allows us to uh, pull out any undesirable pieces uh, of that material. And then anything that's oversized will actually go back into a compost row and go through the process once again. And if need be, um, it may go through a second or third time or a fourth time. But the nice thing about our facility is, is that any of the organics that go in um, are always come out as a finished product. We, there's, no, there's no organic waste that we generate. So everything 
uh, just continues to get composted until it's broken down into a saleable, uh, sizable, uh, usable product, if you will. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you so much, Roy. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, so um, there's a little bit of difference between commercially composted material and um, your backyard. So I just want to dive into what can you can commercially compost versus um, home backyard. So commercially, it's really any food product. The only things that we don't accept are raw meat and uh, like grease and oils. But if you think about a sandwich, pretty much everything on a sandwich can go. So you've got your breads and your um, your meats, your dairies, your uh, produce, um, and even liquids we can take. So expired uh, milks and, and uh, you know, drinks as well. Um, but yeah, the two caveats being no, no uh, raw meat and no uh, grease. Um, what things that we, we don't accept would be anything that's not food related, right? Um, so kind of diving into contamination a little bit. Yeah, we get uh, produce from uh, or any sort of food product from grocery stores. Now this can lead to like those little tiny produce stickers or twist ties that you know around um, uh, or rubber bands around asparagus or um, lettuce, right? So those are all things that we have to, as Roy was mentioning, screen out and um, pull those items out that can be very costly, very expensive, but we also get a lot of produce and stuff from those grocery stores. So it's a lot of product um, that they can't necessarily pull all those items out. Um, but we were talking smaller scale like schools um, and restaurants. Um, they usually have a really clean material um, where they're not putting um, things in there. So just any sort of um, item um, that isn't food based, um, you can't compost. So a little difference I'd like to get into real briefly about home composting versus um, commercial is the main differences that we can't, uh, that you don't want to do for your backyard is meat and dairy. Um, this can draw in those vectors as Roy was saying, so your pests and the rodents that you don't want to have. Um, and it can get smelly and stinky. So just keep with like your breads and your um, fruits and vegetables um, and any like long clippings that you might have. The other big thing is no compostable products. So you think like, okay, this um, cup here says that it's compostable, um, but we don't want that in um, your backyard. We can accept at a commercial level compostable products, um, but not as a residential. Um, also, when you're thinking about home composting, the three things that um, Roy alluded to, um, you want to build enough mass, right? So we have these big piles of 800 feet long by like 14 to 16 feet wide and eight or 10 feet tall, right? So you're not going to build that big of a mass. But if you get a three by three by three pile, that's enough mass to start um, building that accumulation. So building that heat, that is really important. Um, and building that moisture. Um, the final thing would be turning your pile. Now you're not gonna have a windrow turner, but a pitchfork will do. Uh, so it's really important that you turn it a couple times a month, um, get that oxygen back in there, keep those microbes alive. Um, if they die, they die, and then your pile's not gonna break down. So they need oxygen, just as Roy was saying, that they need it and we need it. Um, and then when you think about home composting, you need about 70% browns to 30% greens. And I've included this table here so you can kind of see what are browns and what are greens. So browns are um, a lot of dried material. So you're talking about your leaves, um, anything that doesn't have a lot of moisture content to it. So your bread, bark, um, any sort of dried material. And then your greens will be a lot of your um, uh, wet materials that are heavy in water. Um, that includes a lot of produce and vegetable scraps. So um, so you only want a little bit of, of moisture, and I know that that sounds counterintuitive. It shouldn't be 50-50, but no. Um, if, you, if you have too many greens, what will happen is that it'll start to smell, um, and that's when you notice, okay, I need to add more browns, more newspaper, more leaves, something like that. If you notice that your pile is getting too dry and not breaking down fast enough, um, then that should indicate to you that you need to add more greens. So it's just kind of this push and pull balance that you're trying to figure out um, when you're home composting. Just kind of give it a look. Uh, it needs attention once or twice a week. Um, so that's a really good way. Get familiar with your compost if you decide to do home composting. 
A brief touch point that I like to, I know we're running a little bit past time, so I just want to touch point on biodegradable versus compostable. Um, these two terms in our world get synonymously used and that's not, um, they're actually very two different things. Um, biodegradable, I think, is the worst greenwashing word there is. Um, biodegradable um, breaks down over a long period of time. Um, and when it breaks down, it won't be nutritional. It won't be beneficial um, in the end use. You have to add things to it to make it beneficial. Um, so I think that it's just, it's a very bad greenwashing term. When you see biodegradable, it does not mean compostable. Um, but when you see compostable, um, it's plant-based, usually with cornstarch um, is the product that's made. Um, it breaks down with heat and moisture, so you're talking about a four to six month time period when you're talking about for us um, as a commercial composter. Um, residentially, don't put it in your bins. It will take forever. I've done it way too many times and I should, should have learned my lesson, but it doesn't break down in home compost bins. Um, and microbes help break down that um, and it turns into a beneficial product, which is the best part because then you get to use it. Um, just a high level couple other resources, um, St. Louis Composting, they obviously sell the finished compost. Um, it's in Missouri Botanical um, bags, compost bags. Um, I've put Roy's email on there, so rgross at stlcompost.com. Um, total Organics um, Recycling for your commercial composting, so if you're a business or, or you say, hey, I want this restaurant to start composting, let the business owner know, like, we'd be happy to, um, you know, share with them, uh, you know, how they start composting for their business or their school. Um, so my contacts on there are greathouse at stlcompost.com. Um, actually, International Compost Awareness Week is coming up. If, if anyone does, isn't aware that that is a thing that happens, it's May 3rd through the 9th. Um, it's always the first full week of May. Um, there's a little bit more information, compostfoundation.org. Um, and share waste, a lot of residents ask us, um, is St. Louis composting taking? Um, I know that that was a question that came up on the chat. Um, is St. Louis composting or total organics take residential food waste? We don't. Um, we don't have the capacity and um, we, we would need to like workshop that um, further. Right now it's just commercial. So you can't drop off food scraps at any of our facilities and not all of our facilities are permitted to take food waste and that's another big um, reason why we can't accept it. Um, but sharewaste.com um, is also, it's also an app for your phone and you can find other residents who um, do backyard composting and you can connect with them and drop off your food scraps if that's something that you're interested in. Um, Kiss the Ground has a great YouTube video, um, the compost story. It's about six or eight minutes long and um, dives a little bit more into the soil and um, microorganisms and everything like that. Um, the Food Keeper app, uh, the reason why I'm bringing this one up is because before we waste food, let's make sure that we're storing it properly, right? That we prevent that food waste to even begin. Um, so the Food Keeper app is a great app that I found that um, when I want to know how to preserve something longer so I get the maximum use out of it, um, this you can dive in and say like, how should I store bananas or asparagus or green beans uh, to long to maximize the longevity of the shelf life um, of that fresh fruit and produce so it's not going to waste in the first place. Um, Earthway Center on Saturday, they presented about home vermiculture or vermicomposting. Um, so you can watch that video on Earth Day 365's website and that's home um, composting with worms. So that was a really great uh, like 30 minute video to watch about that, to give you that introduction. And then St. Louis City Recycles um, has a couple blog posts about composting called Why Compost and Compost for Earth Month. So those are just a couple other resources I like to point out. Um, and then last but not least, my thing is not clicking, sorry. Um, so we'll take any other questions. Um, let me get to the chat, see if there's anything else. So Kathy, you asked about the food scraps and bringing it to our facility. No, we can't accept it. Um, and Lori L says, does your company bag and sell the compost for finished? Yes, um, we do. Um, Roy, can you remind me how big those bags are? 
Yes, so it's, it's labeled under the Missouri Botanical Garden name. Uh, so we call it Missouri Botanical Garden Compost. Those are one cubic foot bags, and I believe it's uh, three bags for $14, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, yeah, we can bring it to the truckload um, to your home too. We um, also specialize in some other um, blends as well, like our raised bed mix and our garden mix. Roy, do you want to speak to that real quick? Yeah, so um, if anybody out there is looking for um, productive soils to garden in or to plant with, um, we realize that uh, the St. Louis metro area is not blessed with the greatest soils. So we have developed multiple blends. Uh, you can certainly go to our website, see what those are, but we carry uh, Topsoil Plus, we carry a Garden Mix, we have a Raised Bed Mix, um, and even for any commercial growers, we can basically blend and create any sort of mix that you want. We work with a lot of uh, perennial growers, greenhouse growers, uh, nurseries that grow trees and shrubs, and recently have actually started to get into the cannabis industry a little bit. Uh, and help those folks out with uh, their growing needs. So uh, again, if you need any of that information in more detail, you can please reach, reach out to me through the email. Um, I'll happy, be happy to get back with you and uh, follow up with whatever your needs may be. Good, and it looks like we've got one last question. So if you've got any questions, put them in now. If not, this will be our last question. So Earth Day asks, um, how about the to-go compost containers we get from restaurants? What do we do with those? Unfortunately, in the time that we're living in right now with COVID, um, they just need to be simply disposed of in the trash. Because um, like I mentioned, your home compost backyard, um, you, can't, uh, you can't compost those. You don't get a hot enough temperature uh, to break down those materials. So as of right now, they need to go in the trash. Um, and even if you did bring them home with you, um, you couldn't, you know, compost them. You could bring them back to the restaurant um, if they would let you, if it came from the same restaurant. But, um, but yeah, as of right now, they just need to go simply into the trash and that's okay. That's, you know, the time that we're in. Um, but uh, keep supporting those restaurants that are trying to do the right thing. Um, Green Dining Alliance is a great, uh, uh, you know, way to support uh, sustainable restaurants. And I didn't really show my uh, compost gold, black gold. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. Sorry, my uh, screen. But yeah, this is our black gold compost. So it's nice and light and fluffy. And so I just like to show that as well. But anyway, so it's nice and rich and smells great. It smells like the forest floor. So, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Roy, for joining us as well. Um, our emails are there. If you need anything, give us a holler. Um, we're happy to answer any other questions. Um, but thank you for joining us and have a great Earth Week and Earth Month.